Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got 8.30. Why don't we get started? Good morning, S&P. Good morning. All right. <laughs> Welcome to week number eight. Who had a good weekend? We had a terrific weekend here with our inaugural ball. We had the inauguration of our 20th president, and that was a lot of fun. Hopefully, uh, some of you got to attend those activities on Friday and Saturday. We really had a really nice time. It was terrific, too, to see presidents from years gone by come back to Denison. And uh, these are presidents I had heard about but had not seen myself, and it was really fun to, to welcome the new president in that way. Okay, so uh, a lot of things to do today. First, we have to welcome Lily, who's come to us all the way from, uh, from Michigan. She's a visiting student, and I'm glad that she could join us at 8.30 in the morning. Not a lot of students want to come to an 8.30 class, but we're glad that you're, you're with us, so welcome. Okay, we've done uh, the video for today, which was on face perception and also on visual imagery. And we have lots of demos to do in class. Before we get into those, though, I thought I'd just point out where we are on the syllabus. Today is October 14th, so we'll do object and face perception today. This is the course pack reading number 15. When we come together on Wednesday, paper number two is going to be due, and we'll put those on the table as you come in. We'll have the, the chairs in a big U. I'll say go, and you'll carry the conversation for the next 50 minutes or so. Thank you all for sharing your airtime, as well as you did the last time we had a student-generated discussion on our power and justice issues. Okay? So you're pros at that routine and then we're off to fall study break so we only have uh, the Monday and Wednesday meeting this particular week okay any questions about that okay why don't we begin to get into our conversation everybody had watched the video on our face perception and object perception and this is what we had by way of PowerPoint. Uh, for Lily's benefit, what I typically do is I have this PowerPoint that's available to the students and they can look at the lecture notes uh, as I'm going through this. I go slide by slide in the video and then they have the notes in front of them. And we were talking about whether faces were special or not. Uh, and then we got into visual imagery. So a question for the group, just to get us started. Uh, I mentioned in the video that we sometimes will investigate face perception or visual imagery using MRI. Can anybody re remind us uh, what kind of uh, signal is measured inside of MRI? What exactly does MRI measure in the brain? Anybody want to help us out with that? Thanks, Briella. Yeah. Okay, right. I yeah, so blood oxygen level. Did anybody remember what that acronym spelled out? Bold, okay, so bold was B-O-L-D, and that stands for blood oxygen level dependent, dependent signal, right? So we have the, the bold signal. And anybody want to remind us how that, how do we pick up the bold signal? Right, so the blood oxygen level, anybody? So this is a magnetic resonance imager. Yeah, thanks, Owen. Uh, well, when um, oxygen is getting used up by the blood, certain proteins, uh, a more negative charge and the uh, magnetic impulses are able to pick up on that uh -huh. and okay. if there's a certain amount of um, oxygen being used more in the brain than in other places it'll show up as a uh, contrast if you get an um, image of uh, what's going on in the brain. Excellent. Okay, really, really good. So another way of saying that, and that was very nicely summarized, is that oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties. And in a magnetic resonance imager, we can pick up on those differences, right? So when a particular brain area becomes very active, there's a different level of blood oxygen being drawn there, and, and the MRI can, can measure that. Who's following that? That's basically what the MRI is, is measuring for us? Okay. All right, so that came up several times when we were talking about face perception and object perception. We we're talking about MRIs. And why don't we do a, a demo or two? I think you might find this uh, to be fun. So we were asking the question about whether faces were special cases of object perception. And uh, so we'll go on through and I'll show you uh, a picture that I promised. Okay, so don't yell it out. Please don't yell out the name. But if you know who this is, can you raise your hand? If you can name this person. I'm looking around. Please don't yell out the name. Just raise your hand if you know who that is. Okay. And I'm getting, and Lily can look around also. I think we're getting a pretty null response here. Nobody's quite able to, to um, get that. Okay, let me see if I can change this around just a little bit. Let's see if we get to, ah. Oh, oh my God. Okay, all right. Ah. Mm. <laughs> okay. And this is demo number one. We actually have at least four demos today uh, to build on the lecture that you all saw by way of video. So, yeah, so here it is again, right? And so anybody just want to tell us, how these two have changed. How, what, what do you do to the picture to go from this to that? Becca's got... Your 
you reverse the, the, con the black and white contrast? Yeah, right, okay. So you might remember that we played around earlier this semester with uh, PowerPoint's color wheel where we're changing the colors up here and the colors on any of the images we might project. And we, we could go to the different guns that would be in that projector. There's a red gun, a green gun, and a blue gun, the RGB. What was the range of values that we could put in? It went from zero to how high? 255, right? So we have really 256 different shades of any particular color. So if we take one pixel here, let's say that's a black pixel, uh, or maybe right over here that's a black pixel, uh, that might be really, really low, that might be down at zero, and then we could flip that over here, when we go over to here that becomes white, so we just basically invert the scale. What was zero goes to 255, 255 goes to zero, and Beck is right. This is simply a, a reversal of the, uh, of the luminance. We might call this a change in, in contrast polarity. Uh, who remembers FAPO? From an early, okay, can we all yell out the F in FAPO stands for? Frequency. The A in FAPO stands for? Amplitude. The P in FAPO stands for? Phase. And the O in FAPO stands for? Orientation. Okay, so what, when we do this one, when we go from here to here, and most people couldn't identify who that was, and yet here it is readily identifiable, what kind of a change is that in FAPO? Yeah. Is it a phase shift? That's a phase shift, okay. And can you tell us why that's a phase shift? Um, because you're basically taking... Um, you're taking the luminance of each of these little points and you are shifting it by 180 degrees. In phase, so right, yeah. In phase, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, perfect. And just to remind you of that, we'll break out of this just for a moment and we'll go back over to this guy. Okay, so when we talked about the phase shift a while back, this is a couple of lectures ago, uh, we had this kind of information. So here's dark, light, dark, light, and that's a complete iteration of the pattern. And then if this is a dark, light pattern, and we say that the entire pattern is 360 degrees around the circle, half the way through it would be 180 degrees, and that would be light, dark, and that's what we have here, light, dark, light, dark. Okay, so we've basically swapped out the dark, swapped in the light, that's a phase reversal, and in this case it's 180 degrees phase reversal. Okay, so the point about all of that is when we're engaging in face recognition and we're, we're looking around and we see familiar faces or we're learning new faces, Lily's new with us today, um, we might ask what components of FAPO are particularly important, and what this demonstrates to us is that the phase component in FAPO is especially important. Who's following that? So really easy to recognize face, and all we do is reverse the phase by 180 degrees, and wow, and th there we go. Okay. Questions or comments on, on that demo? It works every year. I find it to be really, really uh, salient. Let's make that a little bit bigger. We'll do maybe one more of these. Okay, so the, the rule here was raise your hand, but don't, don't call out the name because you might have it. We don't want to spoil it for other folks. I think I have one or two others. Okay, If you know who this is, raise your hand. Nothing yet. We'll tweak this just a little bit. Okay. We'll do this a little bit more. Okay. Okay. That's, what, is, what, kind of, what kind of special frequency filtering is that? Anybody want to tell us? A high pass. Can you tell us a little bit? So we have, earlier, Lily, we talked about something called spatial frequency filtering. We talked about a type of physics and mathematics called Fourier analysis. And we can filter different kinds of images. And Harshida described this one as what kind of pass? High pass, high pass filter. So why is that high pass? And that's exactly right. It's a high pass image because it measures the high spatial frequency. Okay. Between Right, okay, the high spatial frequencies are when we have a change in luminance over very, very small regions. You can almost see an outline of whoever this person is. And let's go over to here. How many people have this person by now? Okay, right, okay. And then we go to here, and then we go to here. So this was the original photo. I pulled out the color, and then over here, I thresholded it. If you were above some luminance level, uh, I put it all the way up to 255. If you were below that, I put it down at zero. Here's high pass spatial frequency. What was this kind of spatial frequency filtering, this one? Low pass? Okay, so this is low pass. We get the low spatial frequencies. This is like the blurry image, and then this is the high pass. What's really interesting, Lily, is we were making the point that there are neurons in your brain that are actually seeing this, and other neurons that are actually seeing this inside of that picture. Okay, and the ensemble firing will give you that, even though some of them are only picking up that information, others are picking up only that information. Okay? All right. So here again, I think nobody raised their hand when we were back here. Nobody recognized this, but when we went a few images into it, people were able to recognize who that is. Okay. All right. Real good. Questions on any of that? 
That was our little demonstration that phase matters when we're talking about uh, face perception. The phase of the image matters a whole lot. Okay. All right. Um, let's see if we can move on in the interest of time. We'll see if we can now go to a, another aspect of um, face perception. And this demo was all about, well, actually, before we do this, well, I'm going to do a demo in just a moment, but I thought I'd have you try to design an experiment. Can we try to design an experiment that demonstrates that phase matters in face perception? And the trick here is, can we use signal detection theory to do it? So this would be a really good test question, right? We can think back to signal detection theory. And what does this stand for, FA? Can we all yell? False alarm, okay. Anybody remember what this one stands for? Correct, Correct rejection, miss and hit, okay. And so maybe a stimulus is present uh, or it isn't, no or yes. And then here's the response that we might make, no or yes. So here's our New York, New York um, allocation. And what we want to do is design an experiment, maybe some kind of variation on what we just did, using signal detection theory to answer this question, does phase matter in phase perception? Okay, so you might think about what kind of stimuli might you use in this sort of experiment, how, you might, how might you arrange those stimuli so that you can use a signal detection theory matrix to figure out uh, whether phase matters or not. Okay, so we're going to try to marry what we just did to something that we learned a few weeks ago uh, called signal detection theory. Okay, so why don't we give you a moment to think about that. Why don't you take a couple of minutes and see if you can design an experiment. Feel free to use stimuli like those or variations on those. Marry it to this if you can. And we'll see how we might pull out a D prime and a beta for signal detection theory. And we'll give you a couple of minutes to work on that. So remember, you have to pose a, a question to your participant that can be formed in a yes-no kind of response. Right? A moment ago, we did name that person, but that's not a yes-no kind of response. How can you tweak this to a yes-no? If it helps, these were some of the stimuli that we had seen. Okay, you had a moment or two to think about it, and it, it does take a little while to think it through. Anybody want to get it started with, with how, to, um, how you might begin with the signal detection theory experiment? Okay, thanks, Owen. Uh, rather than asking who the person is, if you were to show uh, two pictures side by side with varying um, degrees of phase shift, okay. and then ask if the people are same or different. Wow, okay, that, that would do it. Okay, so we might have two pictures of me here in this particular case, and we can have a 180 degree phase shift or maybe a 170 degree phase shift, and we can ask same, different, Okay, so that's going to be a binary response. Yes, they're the same. No, they're, they're not the same. Uh, were they the same or different? Yes, they are the same. No, they are not the same. Okay, uh, that would do it. So we can have varying degrees of phase shifts. Jenny had also raised her hand. Did you have something like that, Jenny, or a variation yeah, on that? Yeah, I was thinking you could ask um, if the person in the picture is, say, young or old, and then bring the varying um, which one you ask first. Okay. Okay, right, so it could be, that, that could be a dichotomous judgment. So anytime we get to a dichotomous judgment, we have two possible outcomes. I have no or yes here. It could be young or old. You know, that, that might do it as well. Okay, any other variations on this that somebody was able to, to come to? Right. Now let's say that phase did matter. Okay, phase mattered a whole lot. And let's say that we had two very simple cases. We had the, the case where, unlike this picture, which is out of phase by 180 degrees, we had the case where it was in phase, and that would be my regular photograph, versus out of phase by 180 degrees. And we might have um, a, uh, a case where we can ask about whether uh, people are looking same or different in phase versus same or different out of phase, right? Uh, if D prime were really good, can you show me what that would look like by gesticulation? If D prime were really, really good, on this phase discrimination, how would we, how would our hands look? Wow, there it is, okay. <laughs> and then if it turned out that phase mattered, we'd get a real reduction in D prime. What would that look like with our hands? Okay, right, the two distributions for the neuronal, neuronal firing would be right on top of each other rather than separated like that. 
Okay, who's following that? Is that working for us? Okay. Um, sorry, that, that might not have been entirely clear. We had to go back to something that we were doing earlier this semester. We spent a, about a week or so on signal detection theory. So, All right. All right. Thanks for uh, putting together an experiment. All right. So we'll move ahead through this, and then we'll see if we can now return to some other variations on face perception, and we'll ask about issues relating to, um, uh, to different kinds of expressions that we might have. And as you might remember from the video, some people who are anthropologists and other kinds of scientists have said that if you go to different kinds of societies around the world, there are lots of cultural variations, but what appears to be perhaps universal is maybe these six emotions, okay? And they are fear, disgust, anger, sadness, surprise, and happiness. Now, I do this demonstration each semester, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'll show you a bunch of pictures. We have an actor who's going to be up here, and the actor is going to be demonstrating one of these six emotions. So this is now not a two alternative force choice, the dichotomous response of yes, no. It's a six alternative re response choice. So here are your possibilities. Let's all say them together. Everybody, fear, fear. disgust, disgust. Anger. anger, sadness, surprise, or happiness. So I'm going to put up the picture, and it's the same guy across these six pictures, and you have to figure out which one uh, he's exhibiting. And we'll see if we get some inter-rater reliability, or if the responses are all over the place. Maybe we don't get any agreement here whatsoever. Okay? So here's our actor. Identify the expression. It'll be one of those six. Oops. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> Let me go up to here. Okay, here we are. What expression is that? Surprise? Okay, let's see. They had that one as fear. You had fear? Okay. So fear and surprise were, were mixed with each other. Okay. Let's go over to here. Happy. Happy? Okay. And they have surprise. <laughs> okay. So somebody started yelling out a couple of semesters ago, this guy's not a good actor. <laughs> There's something wrong with this guy. All right, let's see if we do this one. Happy. Hey, all right. So now we're, okay, here we go. On to Okay, so some people say sad, some people say disgust. Okay, they, they had them as sad, okay. Now here we go, here we go. Okay, so mostly anger, uh, somebody says disgust, okay, and then here we go over to here. Ugh, okay, right. Now what's interesting about that is that in many cases, we didn't reach a consensus. There was some, uh, th there was some disagreement among folks. But uh, what I thought was really interesting was over here, almost everybody said anger, but one person said disgust. Nobody said happy. Right? Nobody said surprise. Okay? So even the errors were non-random. Right? I think we were back over here. Um, here we had many people saying sad, but maybe a few people said something like disgust. Right, okay? But nobody was saying happy in this picture. Right? So again, the errors were non-random. Over here, people might have said, I, I think people tended to get happy on that one. Uh, over here, this could have either been surprise or happy, but nobody said anger here. Right, okay? So who's following the idea that the responses that we're making are highly non-random? They're not always perfectly in agreement with one another, but even when there's disagreement, the disagreement might be between a pair of these rather than across all six of these. Okay? And uh, as scientists, we're always interested in non-random, non-randomness generally speaking, but uh, certainly non-randomness uh, with respect to emotions in this particular case. Okay, what I want to do is go back to something that I meant to set up. There is one more really fun demo in here. Okay? All right, and so we have these different emotions, and what, <clears throat> what would we say, uh, hopefully you think maybe she looks happy. Does that work for us? Looking fairly happy in this picture? And then how about if we do it this way? <laughs> okay, so all we've done here is move it through 180 degrees of orientation rather than 180 degrees of phase, and here she looks happy, and here not so much. Okay, so the point about this was that we had trouble recognizing this emotion even when it was physically present on your retina, but it went up this way. Okay, we, we kind of, uh, I thought she looked happy here, and a lot, of, a lot of folks agree. So what we might say here is that orientation matters also for phase perception. And orientation was the O in FAPO, right? So we, we saw earlier that phase mattered, and we did a little signal detection theory where we designed an experiment. And now we can see that orientation matters when we're trying to identify emotions. Yeah? And then when they're right side up, like we have in all of these demos, um, generally there was either a near consensus, or I think in one case there was a consensus, um, but we had highly non-random responding. Okay? All right, so we now know that phase matters and orientation matters for, for phase perception. Questions or comments on any of that? Okay. Okay, 
I wonder if I can ask us to think about this. How might it be the case that FAPO is coded in the brain? Okay, so now we can talk about the neurons that we might have in, say, the primary visual cortex. Okay? And we, we can think of frequency, amplitude, phase, and orientation. And the neurons in our visual cortex are helping us to recognize faces within a given phase. They're helping us to maybe identify or at least narrow down the possible emotions and so forth. So we've talked a little bit about how FAPO might be represented, but now we've got maybe a little more information. Does anybody want to get us started on how, how the brain might do something like a FAPO on whatever image is coming its way? Any notions about that? Thanks, Harshida. Yeah. Okay, okay, right. Yes, there are orientation columns, and I might have those. I don't remember if I have those in my prior lecture or if that was longer ago than that, but that, I think it's uh, even over here, I think we have, we have one example. Okay, so go ahead. Yep. Sorry, we have uh, orientation columns. Okay. Okay, right, so there's the F in FAPO. Here's a low spatial frequency, relatively wide pattern. That same pattern gets shh. Uh, shrunk down to here. So we have high spatial frequencies and low spatial frequencies. So that's the F in FAPO. Here's the orientation in FAPO. Okay. So what else do we need in FAPO to get all of FAPO represented? Here we have the orientation. That's the O. Here we have the F. What else do we need? How about a P in FAPO? Right? So that's phase. How might that be represented? We saw that phase matters. Go ahead, Arjun. The uh, center surround? The center surround? Okay. Off-center, off-surround. Okay, really good. Who remembers that on-center, off-surround? Okay. And we, I think we had that also here, and this was going back a little bit. Okay, but we have these kinds of mechanisms. Ah, here they are. Okay. Here's an on-center, an off-surround. Positive is in center, and off is over here in the surround. And then we can have the reverse configuration. And so that would basically be dark light versus light dark. And that's exactly what we have going on inside of the, um, the pictures that we saw of me and... Um, of other famous people, mm -hmm. uh, our, our famous golfer. Okay, so it might be that we have these kinds of cells that represent phase. Who's following that? There's one other kind of phase selective cell. Anybody remember what that was? You when do you have that one? The simple cells, right? The, there are different kinds of cells in our primary visual cortex. One was called the simple cell, the complex cell, and the hypercomplex cell. Who remembers that? from the videos gone by, okay? So we have a different, couple different ways of talking about phase sensitivity, okay? So now we have uh, everything but the amplitude, right? That was, the A is now missing from FAPO. How might amplitude be represented in the brain? Any notions about that? It's a tough one. We know how we've got phase. We know how we have orientation. We know how we have relative frequency. Amplitude? Yeah, do you have an idea, Harshida? Um, Hypercomplex cells? Hypercomplex cells? Yeah, okay. N they are n-stopped. What did so n stop means basically they're length selective. Okay, right. All right. So um, we have to change that somehow though to an amplitude. How do we get an amplitude out of that? Any notions about that? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, like the gamma cell, they have center surround antagonism. Okay. So it's sensitive like, to the contrast. Of okay. Right. The, Okay, there is some contrast there that, that, can, um, that can help us out. So here, here's center surround antagonism, right? That might be perhaps more related to phase. We have light in the center, dark in the surround. Okay? Here's one way of thinking about it. Here's a cell that's firing, and it's firing at a relatively slow rate. And then here's a cell that's firing at a faster rate, okay? So it could be that the rate of firing corresponds to the amplitude of the stimulus out here, which is to say that maybe if we have a really high contrast image, we get a lot of firing. If we reduce the contrast, maybe the firing begins to slow down a bit. Who's following that? Okay, so it might be that we use something like a rate code or a time-related code to capture the amplitude, and then we have all these other ways of capturing the remaining properties of FAPO. Okay? All right. Okay. Why don't we go on to our next item and see what people have there. I'm going to flip back over. And before I do that, let me ask... Um, if people have any questions on faces so far. Yes, please. I mean, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. Uh -huh. um, when I did research here two summers ago, okay. Dr. Rosenberg was working on how children with autism cannot differentiate between 
Okay, children with autism have trouble making these decisions. Of course, we didn't do so well ourselves, to me. but on the other hand, we, we had some ambiguity, but we also had some consistency. Maybe we, we mixed fear and anger, but we never mixed fear with happiness, for example. They had that problem, like with positive and negative emotions. They couldn't tell. The, yeah, they're really, they're, they're almost entirely random. So would right. that be something like in the brain? Okay, and let's, let's talk about it. Anybody remember what area of the brain we, we mentioned is um, particularly important for recognizing faces? Can we yell it out if we recall what it was? Infra yeah. Inferotemporal cortex, or we sometimes abbreviate that IT. Can we begin to point to where that is, the inferotemporal cortex? Let's all see if we can point to where the inferotemporal cortex is. So if, if you're not sure how to get started, here, these would be the temporal lobes up over here, and we learned that this would be the inferior portions or the, um, the lower portions. I also introduced another word that went along with inferior versus superior. And anybody remember how that went? Ventral and dorsal. Ventral is lower, dorsal is higher, okay? And what was our little mnemonic? Can you show me? We had a little gesture in the video. There, Riella's got it. <laughs> Jenny's got it, okay. Can either of the two of you tell us what you're doing with your hands? Why are you making that gesture? <laughs> the dorsal fin, okay? The dorsal fin on a shark. Who's heard of that before? The dorsal fin on a shark, okay? So that reminds us that if we put the dorsal fin up here, this is toward the top of our head, and then ventral would be in the opposite direction. So the inferotemporal cortex seems to be important. So Harshita's question was based on some work that she had done a few summers ago with uh, Dr. Rosenberg, or, or she, she, was, she was mentioning it, right, yeah. Right, okay, so that's very interesting. So it might be the case that children who are on the autistic spectrum do have difficulty uh, with, with this more so than uh, a, a more typically developing child would have, and we might wonder if that would suggest that there is some different kind of activity in their inferotemporal cortex. At least that would be a good place to start, right? Okay. So then we could uh, begin to put uh, typically developing children into an MRI where they're looking at faces like that, and then we could put children who are on the autistic spectrum into the MRI, and we could look for a difference maybe in inferotemporal activity as measured by the bold signal. Okay. That's a great idea. Yeah. Really good comment. Other comments on, on this? Okay. In a few minutes, I want to go over to visual imagery, but I also want to throw out one word. That word is greebles. Anybody remember hearing about greebles in, in the video? And who can tell us anything about, maybe Jenny can tell us something about greebles, if you wouldn't mind? Um, well, they were computer animated um, like images. Okay. They could be completely novel, so something that people have never seen before. Uh -huh. And um, they kind of had the same characteristics that maybe a face would have. Okay. Um, similar to like nose, mouth, and ears. Okay. Uh-huh. Right, yeah. Learn about um, different features and try to find them based on that. Okay, really good. Yeah, so here, here are the greebles, right? And these are entirely commu computer animated objects. And um, uh, these are the different sexes that they come in. They're not male and female. They're pluck and glip. And what was, so you alluded to it. So why does the researcher use words like pluck and glip rather than male and female? Do you mind? Yeah, did you want to add to that? That was, okay, okay, that, that was the idea, yeah. And I think the idea was something like um, these things, these, were, these are the boges. Can we all show our boges here? Let's all do this. These are the boges, okay. Anybody remember where our dunth is? Our dunth is, oh, uh, this, is this is the dunth. <laughs> I think that's the dunth, right, okay. So uh, they have these characters, and otherwise you and I might have called these ears, but they're trying to get away from all these associations, okay. And can, yeah, please go ahead. Um, I was just wondering how they controlled for, um, like I know that they assign different names to the different parts, Yeah. but how do they know that I, in my mind, I'm not saying, oh, that nose looking thing is different. Okay, that's, it, that's it a, does sort of resemble a nose. Yeah, right, it does sort of resemble a nose. So they might learn, for example, that maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe the quiff is the nose, right? So you just learn to make that translation, right? So you're really thinking nose, but if you're prompted, you could use the word quiff, right? And I think that's, I think that's a fair criticism, right? We don't really know what the person is thinking. And I hope you'll hold on to that criticism because in a few minutes, we're going to do another demo where we're going to engage in visual imagery. And we think that you're using visual imagery to solve the problem, but you actually could use a word-based strategy, kind of like what you're using over here. We're calling this thing a quiff, but maybe 
you know, you're thinking of it as a nose, or you're thinking of these as ears, but we call them boges, right? So, so it might be the case that they're still using that. Um, that's, I think that's a fair criticism. This is fun that there's a, a Samer family, and then this has one name, and that has a different name. Anybody want to tell us what the findings were generally, if you recall from this experiment on, uh, on the Greebles? Jenny got us started really well. well. What were some of the take-home messages? Maybe Emily's got something. Okay. Okay. Real good. Was that was that a stretch or okay? Just just a stretch. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. Thanks. Um, the same region in the brain was active with this as it's active with these. Yeah. Right. Okay. So after when, when they first started practicing, the level of activity in the inferotemporal cortex was not particularly high. But after we bring them in and we give them several thousand trials, and a trial is just we show you one of these and you name it. We show you another one and you name it. So a trial might only take a second or two. So in the course of an hour, you can train somebody over several hundred trials, and then you have to come back for a few days, and after a few days they've done a, a few thousand trials. And then after all of that training, all of a sudden the inferotemporal cortex becomes very active. Okay? And that's exactly the place that would have become active when we had face recognition going on. And yet these aren't faces, right? Now Becca's got a good challenge here. Maybe, well, they're not really faces, but they're kind of faces because we can say, well, the quiff is the nose. And, um, but early on, we weren't getting this recognition uh, in area IT, and then after practice, we did get there. So that, that was kind of an interesting finding. Can anybody help us out with what we called in the video the subordinate level classification? I think Briella alluded to it. There was a, sub, there was a behavioral designation called subordinate level. June, do you want to Help us out with that. I'm not too clear that like, I'm going to be describing this right, but in the terms of subordinate level classifications, uh -huh. we basic our brains basically have like general ideas of what images of certain objects are. Like if you I, if I mention a chair mm -hmm. in our minds, we always have the idea of what a chair will look like, like four legs, maybe, maybe made of wood, and like a uh, spine where you can like rest your back, and like that's usually something we don't really have to think. About. Okay. But when we say something like faces, like we always have to have like further categories for how you would describe okay. a face. And like okay. In terms of descriptions, like how would you describe eyes? How would you describe your nose? Okay. Just fall into the subordinate level, like you know, at least like more. In going more into detail with this Okay, so there's a hierarchy there, right? There's maybe the overall category and then there's finer designations. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay. Any, any further details? you want to put to that? So, so the idea would basically be that we can have people make discriminations, yes, no discriminations. Is this a face or is this a non-face? Okay? And we can ask how quickly they do that. And then we can also have, have them make judgments about whether it's a particular kind of face. You know, is this a face of Bill Clinton? Is this a face of Hillary Clinton? Uh, and, and you can make yes, no judgments along those. And people can typically make those, uh, as we call them, subordinate level classifications with faces as quickly as they can make face, non-face discrimination. Who's following that? So not only do you know that's a face, but as quickly as you know it's a face, you also know that it's a particular kind of face. And that was true also with a certain amount of practice with these greebles. Early on, you could tell it was a greeble versus a computer, or a greeble versus a canister of this sanitizer. <laughs> okay, you can make those distinctions very quickly. But you couldn't tell greeble A from greeble B. But after about a thousand trials or so, you had the subordinate level classification. And when that came on board behaviorally, we also got the physiological uh, counterpart to that in the infrotemporal cortex. Okay. Who's following that? Is that working for us? Okay. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. So let's move on and see if we can talk a little bit about uh, visual imagery. And um, okay, why don't we go ahead and see if we can do maybe a visual imagery um, demo and then we'll, we'll have some conversation about the demo. Okay? So we were trying to figure out how much overlap there might be between stimulus-driven vision. Right now your eyes are open and you're seeing me and you're seeing the people around you and we're getting activity back here that's being driven initially by the light in the room. But we can also cl have you close your eyes and take that imaginary walk. In fact, we did that during the video. What was the imaginary um, trip that we took you on during the video? Anybody want to recall for us? We had you close your eyes and think about something. Go ahead, Jenny.
Okay, right. All right. So let's just do that for a moment. Can we all close our eyes and think about a home that, that is home to you? That might mean um, wh whatever that means to you. I realize some people might have moved around a few times. And imagine that you're in your home uh, with your maybe the place where you were raised, and now you're in your kitchen specifically. And I'd like you to take a walk over to the sink in that that house uh, or apartment or wherever it was that you were raised and take a good look at the sink and see if you can now extract the sink's color. Okay, If you can get the sink's color with your eyes closed, can you raise your hand? And people are seeing that quite, okay, oh, just about everybody in the room can do that. Okay, now, if you can walk away from the sink and walk over to the fridge, as Jenny told us a moment ago, can you saliently see the color of the fridge in the home of, okay, you've got that, you can raise your hand, okay? All right, um, and then let's see, what else can we do? I wonder if I can ask you to think about the kitchen table for a moment, uh, assuming there is a kitchen table. Can you look at the kitchen table, maybe pull your focus back a little bit, and try to count how many chairs there are typically at the kitchen table? Not on an exceptional day when you moved in more chairs for Thanksgiving, or but it's on a typical day, right? Can you see, and maybe you can actually count how many chairs you have. Can you put up the number, by using the number of fingers on your hand, how many chairs you have? Okay, <laughs> okay, really good. Now, I'm gonna um, pause this for a moment here, I ask you to open your eyes, and I notice that um, our visitors from, uh, from Michigan both put up six. Are you thinking about the same kitchen, maybe? I don't know, <laughs> okay. What was, do you remember your sink color, Lily? Uh, it's like silver. A silver. Now, were you thinking of the same sink, or okay, same okay? How did we do on the fridge? White. It's white. Okay. Did anybody have a non-white fridge here? Okay, so several non-white fridges. Okay. Now, I can't verify any of this, but the point is that we have these very salient psychological experiences, and they're visual experiences, but they're not being driven by the light here in the room. They're being driven by this imagery, this almost visual kind of memory. So a moment ago, we talked about how we can put up these different faces and we can have children who are on the autistic spectrum um, uh, make judgments about these faces and typically developing students will make judgments about these faces. All of those faces would be stimulus driven. But what we just did was not stimulus driven, right? We're using this top down process. From intro to psych, who remembers bottom up versus top down? Does that sound familiar? Okay. This was a top down kind of, of um, exercise that we did. And we might ask how much anatomical overlap is there between stimulus driven vision and visual imagery, right? So it's an interesting kind of a question. All right, so we'll go to what was happening inside of the Harvard lab. There's a, a doctor from Harvard, Steve Koslin, and he did something like this, okay? Uh, we'll have you um, uh, look at an image in just a moment. Okay, here's the image I'd like you to take a look at, and we'll have you try to memorize this to the extent that you can. And we're going to, I'm gonna ask you to make uh, one of four responses in a moment. We'll call this quadrant one, two, three, and four, and those are well labeled if we think about how we read. When we read, we start in the upper left, and we go from left to right. These are actually not well labeled if you think about trigonometry, and we have a different idea about what quadrant one is and what quadrant two and, and three. Who remembers that from trig? This is normally quadrant one and trig, okay? But if you'll, you'll play along with us, uh, when Coslin was doing this, he was sampling lots of different folks. He couldn't presume that everybody had trigonometry. So he labeled this one, two, three, and four because it was a greater, there was a greater probability that people were actually the English readers, and they would start up here. So one, two, three, and four. Well, let's get a look at that. And then in a moment, I'll ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you a question about this. And we'll ask you to use your visual imagery to answer the question. Okay? So we'll let you take a good look at that. I'll ask you the question, and with your eyes closed, I'll ask you to put up either one finger, if you think the correct answer is this one, two fingers, three fingers, or four fingers. Okay? All right, so you've got an idea about that. Would you all please now close your eyes? Okay? And here comes my question. My question is, compare quadrants two and three in your mind's eye, and the question specifically is, when you're comparing quadrants two and three, which has more bars? Please don't yell out the answer, just put up the number of fingers. Which has more bars, quadrant two or quadrant three? Okay, so put up your vote when you have it. Okay, please put up your hand nice and high so everybody can see it. Okay, that's really good. And I wonder if you can all now keep your hand up and open your eyes and look around the room and see what kind of, uh, convergence we have on number two. The question again was, um, which has more bars? And I'll go back. Everybody's voting for number two, and you can see that that was correct. Okay? Now let's go back to Becca's question from a moment ago. Becca said, you know, are they really using imagery, or might they use something else? Like you knew that you had uh, a nose or something along these lines. So somebody could have done this by saying, well, I'm going to say that Box number two has a 45 degree tilt, and there are three of them, and they're sort of um, medium and width, that, that kind of, you could have done that. How many people, though, didn't do that? They, they felt that subjectively they just saw the image in their head, and they were able to do it that way, just by visual imagery, okay? Did anybody try to make a parts list 
Like, okay, you had to use a parts list. Okay, so it could have gone either way. Okay, let's do a couple more of these and we'll see how we do. I'll let you practice on this again. Okay, that's the image. And we'll ask you to do one or two more of these. Okay, and that's the image. Okay, if you close your eyes now. Okay. okay, compare in your mind's eye quadrant one to quadrant four. And here's my question. When you're comparing quadrant one to quadrant four, which one has longer bars? Which one has longer bars? You can vote with your fingers. Okay, you can put either a one or a four up. Okay, which one has longer bars? Okay, and we'll have you vote when you can, hands up nice and high. Okay, and then, okay, we'll let you open your eyes and take a look around. And it looks like most people are saying one, but not everybody had that. Let's go back over here and see what the answer is. And so here's one and here's four, and one had longer bars. So what you can do is you can make these fairly involved images, and you can ask really quite a lot of questions, and we can then see, well, how plausible would it be to really make a parts list on length and on size and on angle and so forth? And it might just be more parsimonious to use uh, visual imagery to answer all of these. All right, anybody want to remind, remind us what portion of the brain became active when Coslin was having people do this visual imagery? He has them lying in a MRI, and he's asking the, the questions that I just asked you. Anybody remember what portion of the brain became active? Yeah. It was, was it uh, V1? Yeah, it was area V1, the primary visual cortex, all the way back here in the occipital lobe. Okay? And that's actually the area that also becomes active when you're looking at this thing and it's stimulus-driven. So we have the same regions of the brain for stimulus-driven vision and for visual imagery, which is pretty interesting. Uh, anybody want to help us out, too, with uh, what was going on with TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation? It was how this thing was ending. We talked a little bit about TMS and what Coslin did there. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Becca, do you have to start? Um, okay. Yeah, he uh, slowed the reaction times by 200 milliseconds so that he could more easily compare yeah. whether um, whether they actually viewed the stimuli or engaged in the imagery. Right. Okay. All right. So let's let's put some um, some background to that. That was actually a really really good response, right on target. So this is the transcranial magnetic stimulator, and this is another kind of high tech device. We talked about two different kinds of high tech high-tech devices. One was the MRI, right? And the, what does the F stand for in, uh, in FMRI? Functional. functional. Okay, so he actually did FMRI, so he had people performing the task. They were doing a function while the MRI was being taken. And Owen was right that this area became active. And then what goes on is, rather than just eavesdropping on the brain and trying to understand what might be active, we can actually alter the state of the brain using this transcranial magnetic stimulator. So this is the device itself that holds a, a charge. And we put the charge out on uh, this device, and I can hold that device, I'll use June as my example, I can hold the device back here on June's head, and I zap him. It's really quite interesting that it makes a noise about this loud, okay, and that's, that's the noise that you hear, and then what you feel is kind of like a plunking on your head. Can you all plunk your heads? <laughs> okay, and then plunk your neighbor's head. You have my permission to plunk your neighbor's head. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, plunk June, <laughs> okay? All right. So you'll hear, a, you'll hear it like that, okay, and that's what it feels like. Before, before, as you might remember, before I came to Denison in 2001, I spent four years doing my postdoc at uh, Columbia University in New York City, and I, one of my last experiments was a transcranial magnetic stimulation experiment, and we were plunking each other's heads with these devices and, and trying, to, uh, trying to disrupt behavior. So in, in the Coughlin experiment, you know, he has you do what you just did a moment ago, and part of the time you're lying in the MRI, the other part of the time you're getting your head plunked by this thing, okay? And uh, what you can show is you get a slowing of the response uh, when you're plunking area V1, but if I now plunk over here, what's this called? Anybody remember this region? It's controlling my speech? Broca. Broca's area? Okay, good. From intro to psych, remember, that's Broca's area. If we, if we hit Broca's area with this magnetic pulse, then we don't get any kind of change in performance. But if we, if we plunk back here, we do get a change in performance. So there's some specificity in where we can place this thing and how it can alter behavior very, very selectively. And the fact that we can disrupt the behavior when we plunk this, but not that, would suggest that maybe this region of the brain is now controlling that behavior. Who's following the line of reasoning anyway? Okay? So what we can do is we can walk by this room and look in, and we can see that the lights are on, and we can also see that that switch is in the up position. And what we might say is, I see a correlation between the light being on and that switch being up. And that's a correlation. But with this, we're almost directly manipulating the state of the brain. We turn it on, we turn it off. We turn it on, 
we turn it off. Yeah? I can go to some other switch and throw that switch and find that that switch doesn't control that light. Here what we're doing is we're kind of, if you will, turning the brain on and off by directly manipulating it, which is one step further than what MRI does. MRI allows us to see activity, but it doesn't allow us to change activity. So the MRI data are, on some level, correlational, whereas these are directly experimentally manipulable. Who follows that distinction? Okay. And that's why some scientists find this to be more persuasive even than the, uh, the MRI evidence, which they find to be fairly persuasive. Go ahead, Jim. Um, this is just a question. I think I read once about an experiment. I'm not sure. I'm just wanting to know if this would have been the same apparatus. Because I once read of an experiment where they kind of used something that induced temporary blindness. And yeah. Like, it, it, to induce temporary blindness in participants. Okay. Like they would I think it's something like that, where they would just like interfere with like the synapses in their brain, with the firing of their brain, and it would cause them to become temporarily bl temporarily blind for like a second to half a second. Yeah, sure. And then they were asked to, and once it, in the half millisecond, and, and like the milli first hundred or five hundred milliseconds after the <laughs> visual comes back, they were asked to like they, there was this visual stimulus, and then they were asked what was the stimulus. Uh huh. Right. I'm not sure what I Yeah, yeah that, that could very plausibly have been this because we do lose, uh, in this case, visual function for something on the order of maybe uh, a fraction of a second. Right? The pulse itself actually occurs over uh, just something like a millisecond, but it has a reverberant effect through the brain that might last for tens of milliseconds or maybe a hundred milliseconds or something along that. And yes, if you have a very briefly flashed image and you take it away while you're being zapped, and you have to get that timing right, it takes a while to get that timing, um, then uh, you can actually render that stimulus invisible. We, I, and then if you show the same stimulus, but you're zapping now maybe the frontal lobe, the, the, that stimulus would remain visible. So uh, it's, it's fairly specific in space. Please go ahead. I think I'm just giving him context. That was the video I showed for Blindside. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there, there are different ways of getting... Uh, you, you can do that kind of experiment using TNS. No, I'm just... Right. <laughs> right. 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 Go ahead, Becca. Um, I just am having trouble sort of grasping um, how this is related to comparing the retinal stimulation to the visual imagery if they if they both happen in the same. Period. Good, good, real good. So what we can do is we can have you lie in the uh, the MRI device while you're doing the uh, the exercise that we did just a moment ago. So we show you those four quadrants. We ask you to try to memorize those. Close your eyes if you can. In the MRI, they just take the image away. They ask you the questions and they see how well you do. And while you're engaged in imagery, they're uh, they're measuring what part of the brain becomes active. And it turns out to be the occipital lobe area V1 is really quite active. Okay. So then what happens is um, well that's kind of like walking by and seeing that there's a correlation between alleged imagery and what's going on in the MRI. Can we now directly manipulate that? And here we're putting a pulse into the brain and we're showing that it disrupts the, the behavior. Does that, does that work for it us? It disrupts the behavior. Yeah, right. And so that it slows the behavior down. establishes a more causal relationship. That's right. That's right. It gives okay. us a better, a better claim on causation. Okay. okay. That works. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Something else on that? Yeah, please go ahead, uh, Arshina. Would it be related to dreams? Now that's very interesting. It would be very cool if you had somebody, and maybe this has been done, I'm not sure, if you had somebody sleeping in an MRI, and when they go into REM, and we could measure their eye movements, to deter and, and we could see if all of a sudden maybe area V1 becomes particularly active during, uh, uh, during rapid eye movement, and that might be a, a neural correlate of the visual imagery that they're having in their dreams. That may have been done. I would imagine that's a tough experiment to do. You have to get somebody to be willing to sleep in an MRI for the whole night or a good portion of the night. And, uh, not an easy measurement to make, but in principle doable, and maybe has been done. They, they could do it with other animals. Yeah. Does anybody, other animals have REM? They have REM. Now, whether they dream or not is a bit up for, uh, up for grabs, right? But uh, in, a, in a way that's similar to ours, but surely they have REM. By the way, who's seen that in their own dogs? You've seen your dogs, right? And you can see their eyes going. Sometimes their, their feet start going during REM also, right? Or they start to bark or something along these lines, right? Okay, uh, why don't I end with a, um, a simple story on um, TMS, and that is, before I did my TMS experiment, I was a TMS participant, and they zapped my Broca's area, and that controls what? <coughs> Broca's area? Speech production, specifically. So they had me simply count out loud to 10, and they told me that they were going to zap me on 6, okay? So I started counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 
eight. I couldn't get out the. I couldn't get out six at all. But I had no trouble getting out seven. So it only throws you off for you know um, a few hundred milliseconds or something like that. But I completely lost control of of my tongue. And then they had me do it again, and they zapped my left Broca's area, and it had no effect. So someday, if I have a stroke, I'm hoping that it happens on this side, and I'm like, I turn out to be very lateralized, as is true for many of us. But the TMS indicated that I'm quite lateralized in my speech production. Okay. Any last comments? As you're beginning to wrap up, I just thought I'd mention one thing. My TMS paper, of, of the papers that I've had, it's been cited more than my others. It's been cited 41 times, which is, for me, a lot. There are people who have papers cited 1,000 times or so, but it's, it's my, um, my current champion. And later on, on November 15th, we're going to be having a Skype session with one of the graduates of this class. His name is Ray Stanley. And Ray Stanley and I did a project together that we published. And a few years after it was published, in fact, just earlier this year, um, it was cited in a TMS journal. Uh, there was a journal that was um, talking about how to apply TMS to disrupt sound localization, and that's what Ray and I had studied in our paper. And they basically took uh, the stimulus that Ray and I use, and they now applied TMS to people while they were listening to the stimulus that we had used. So Ray will tell us all about that during our Skype session. All right, thanks for a good conversation today, and I look forward to seeing you in this context on Wednesday, and some of you I'll see tomorrow in our research class. Thank you, Lily, and uh, yes, thanks for having, uh, having us. Yep. <clears throat> Some of these students are pre med. Yeah, yeah so. I would think that would directly tie in. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. Especially as your age. And I'm looking this for a while. Thanks for joining us. I'm so glad that you were here. Are you thinking about pre med? Are you, are you, are you mentioned pre med. No, no, I don't know if you just, just personally, I was a chemistry major. Oh, was you were? Like, yeah. No, I, I don't know if pre med. But I think yeah. was directly, I thought, wow, this makes. This seems like a required class. You know, uh, what's yeah. fun about this is it's actually a psychology class, but in the psych program, I'm also a, I do also teach in the neuroscience program. So you can see that uh, some folks with pre-med would have an interest there. Right, well. so, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah great. I think we need new psychology at school right now. Oh, you are? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we just... A lot of the brain, like Broca's area. Yeah. Sort of oh, okay. So you knew about Broca's yeah, area. Yeah. Have you ever been zapped by TMS in your Broca's area? <laughs> <laughs> I practiced it today. All right. All Thank right. You. See you. Thanks for coming in. Which measure would go so completely against ecological objects? Um, a lot of the ecological, that's a very good point, a lot of the ecological optics folks would say everything that you need is right here. Why would you need to store anything in the brain, right? And then here you are closing your eyes and you're in your, your kitchen in India telling me what color or how many seats are, there are. Please yeah. come on in. Thank you so much. Um, question for you. Yes, sure. Okay. I'm listening. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. This, well, that would be awesome. I do not know what we're trying.